Bible, Matthew 3. <coughs> you know, there are a lot of things that often are going on behind the scenes that we know nothing about. For example, before a foreign dignitary visits our country, a head of state or a government official, tremendous preparation takes place beforehand. Months beforehand, uh, things are being set up, uh, hotel reservations, restaurant reservations, uh, the person that will meet this dignitary, the person that will return that dignitary uh, to their uh, airport and their plane, the planning of the schedule, all of that is uh, all arranged ahead of time behind the scenes. In ancient times, before a king would uh, visit another country, he would send an ambassador ahead to be sure that everything is in place for the king's arrival. Messiah Jesus is Israel's king. And he had an ambassador that he sent ahead of him. He is called in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist. His Hebrew name is Yohanan. I want you to think of Baptist in a different way. I want you to understand the real meaning of that word that is translated Baptist. It is a word that means immerser. You know what it means to immerse something? It means to completely submerge that object under something. We're talking about water. It means to completely submerge that object or that person under the water, to immerse them. This is a baptismal tank here that we use when we have uh, public baptism, believer's baptism, and in this we completely submerge or immerse the people. So when you see that, uh, that uh, moniker for John, John the Baptist, you should think in your mind, John the Immerser. John the Immerser. That's, how I, that's what I want to use instead of the word Baptist today, just so you keep that thought in your mind. So, Messiah Jesus, Israel's king, is about to present himself, and he sends John the Immerser as his ambassador, sends him ahead as the forerunner to prepare the way to say, King Messiah is here. He's arrived. It's time for you to welcome him. And so in the first uh, 12 verses of this third chapter, I want you to see the preparation for the welcoming of King Messiah being Jesus of Nazareth. And then in the rest of the chapter, I want you to see how the king himself is presented. So we'll look at the preparation of King Messiah, and then we'll look at the presentation of King Messiah, who is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. Before we do, let's, let's pause a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for the sending of your, the one you called your beloved Son, the one in whom you delighted. And I pray today that our focus would really be on Him. That's the reason that we are here. And we want to worship Him. We want to lift Him up. We want to exalt the Lord Jesus. He is the one that we want to know about today. So Spirit of God, instruct us. Give us that unction, that anointing from the Holy One. Not only the messenger, but also the hearers and bring about a great work today in our hearts and lives, that Jesus might be magnified before us in our midst. Let us see him with spiritual eyes. Let's sense his spiritual presence here. We make that a reality. We pray for his sake, and then for ours. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So let's look then in chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel. Remember last week in chapter 2, there's a big stir going on. In fact, if you look at uh, the third verse of Matthew 2, when Herod had heard these things, what things? The things that the wise men came saying. They had a question, where is he that is born the king of Judea? When Herod heard these things, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And so there was a major stir going on in Jerusalem at the birth of this king of Judea, as he's called in that chapter. Well, fast forward 30 years. There's 30 years between Matthew chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 3. In addition to that, it has been 400 plus years since the nation of Israel has heard any speaking prophet. There has been no voice from God. The heavens, you might say, have been relatively silent. God hasn't spoken to His people. They're not on speaking terms for over 400 years. This is phenomenal what's happening here. This is greatly significant. And the preparation that went into it is just amazing. There is a messenger that is sent ahead. John the Immerser. And I want you to note in chapter 3, as we read just the first couple of verses, how it begins. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Basically, his preparation was a message. And the, the imparting of that message was really, it was just one message, but it had two main points. And the first main point is repent. See that? Now the word translated repent is a word that literally means, listen to me, to change your mind. Mm -hmm. To change your thoughts. To change your opinion. There is an absolute necessity for a person's mind to be changed, for, a, for our thoughts to be changed, for our opinions to be changed, if we will ever be prepared to receive this Messiah, Jesus. In fact, even as believers, our minds have to constantly be changed. We are told in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we should not be conformed to this world. We should not be shaped and fashioned into the mold that this world desires us to be in. Our thinking shouldn't be shaped by pop culture. Our thinking shouldn't be shaped by the political climate. Our thinking should be something that we renew day by day, and we do that in the Bible. God's Word is the mind renewer. And the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to renew our thinking every day. That is a daily practice that has to happen, even in the believing life. There is a need for repentance, you might say, or a change of thinking. A change of mind. Otherwise, we just settle into the status quo. And we just go with the flow. And uh, as a result, we become unusable to God. We become really more of a burden to God than, than a blessing and uh, useful to His service. And so there is a call here, first of all, to repentance. A changing of the mind. About what? Repentance is first a changing of your thinking regarding God. When people initially repent, they see God differently. Instead of seeing God as a person they want to avoid, instead of seeing God as someone to blaspheme, instead of seeing God as someone uh, that they would hate, when a person re repents, they change their mind about God. 
and instead of being revolted by him and running from him, they run to him. They embrace him. They receive him. Repentance is a change of mind about God. And it also, when you change your mind about God, you change your mind about everything. But another main thing that repentance is, it's a change of mind about sin. Instead of running to sin, you want to run from it. It's a change of mind about yourself. Instead of seeing yourself as pretty good, instead of seeing yourself as worthy, instead of seeing yourself or, or living for yourself, when you repent, you see yourself in a total different light. No longer do you brag about yourself. No longer do you lift up yourself. No longer are you happy with yourself. You're disgusted with yourself. You, you see yourself for what you are apart from God. And so repentance is a complete, absolute change of thinking. Have you repented? This morning as you sit here, this morning as you watch online, have you repented? Has your mind changed? Is your thinking different? Is your opinion of God, yourself, and sin, is it changed? Does it need to? Repentance, because it is a change of mind, is something that happens inwardly. It's an inward change. It's not an outward change. It's an inward thing. It's an inward change that leads to a practical and corresponding lifestyle change. But it begins, and at first is, an inward change. And uh, it's really, that word repent, is, it stresses a change of heart. Have you had a change of heart? You know what it is to have your heart change? Your heart is your thinking. Your heart is your feeling. Your heart is your choosing. Have you had a heart change? Repentance is that. It's a heart change. It's an inner change that uh, consequently brings an outward change of life. Repent. Second part or point of his message, if you'll look with me at uh, the second verse, is not only repent, but for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. By the way, Matthew of the four Gospels is the one that pretty consistently uses the phrase the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. We don't know why, but we think perhaps it might be because uh, to use the name of God was uh, something that Jewish people would do their best to avoid. And so he puts heaven in, instead of the kingdom of God, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. Thirty times in his gospel, he refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. Here he's saying, the kingdom of heaven has come. It's near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. You see, all of the Jewish scriptures up to this point have prophesied and pointed to the promised Messiah and the kingdom that he would establish. And so his message is the coming one, the Messiah, is here to establish the coming age, this new age, the kingdom age. It's here. It's time. You need to be ready to welcome King Messiah. That's what he's saying. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's come here. I want you to note also a sub-point of his message on repentance. Jump down with me in this chapter to verse 7. In verse 7, when he saw that many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to his baptism. Now these are two groups in the first century uh, Judaism that were in leadership among the Jewish people. The religious leadership were made up of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'm not going to go into the, the difference between them. But he saw these Jewish religious leaders coming to observe his immersing. 
And he said to them, oh, generation of vipers, what a way to win friends and influence people. <laughs> oh, ye generation of vipers, who hath warned you to, to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruit that are suitable for repentance. In other words, show outwardly that you have inwardly had a change of heart. And then verse 9, and don't think within yourselves, we don't have to repent because Abraham is our father, so we're okay. I say unto you, God's able to raise children of Abraham from these stones alongside the Jordan River that you see. And then he says in verse 10, and also the axe is laid under the root of the tree. Now what do you think the, the root of the tree is? Therefore, Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's pretty scathing. But that's his message to these Jewish religious leaders. It's basically a call for them to truly repent. And their repentance, they need a, a change of mind about themselves. They were full of self-righteousness. They were full of themselves. And it's a call to repent and have a change of mind about your righteousness. That your righteousness isn't sufficient. Just because you're Jewish people, just because you're the descendants of Abraham, doesn't give you a foot into heaven, into the kingdom of heaven. No, not at all. That is not the, the criteria for getting there. It's not your biological birth. It's not that you're born into a believing family. It's not that you perform religious ritual or exercises. Not at all is what he's saying. He's showing them for what they really are. They are not righteous like they think themselves to be, but they are snakes. They have been bitten by the, 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 the snake of sin. And they are guilty sinners before God. They needed to repent and have a change of mind. In fact, he said if they didn't, they were going to suffer the very wrath of God's judgment, as everyone else will, who rejects Jesus, the Messiah. And so it's a call to them to repent. Now, go back to verse 3. And uh, look at verses 3 and 4, and we get a little bit of a uh, picture of how John the Immerser, how he carried himself. It says, for this is he, speaking of John, this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment or his clothing of camel's hair, that is woven camel's hair, and a leathern girdle or a, a, a belt of leather about his waist. And his meat or his food was locust and wild honey. This is... John the Immerser. Here's his image. Uh, his image is, he's a prophet. In fact, that uh, third verse is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3, which says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. What we are told about John the Immerser is that he is the fulfillment of that prophetic utterance by Isaiah in chapter 40 and verse 3 of his prophecy. And also, he is, uh, that, that would explain to us, first of all, why he's in the desert. Why he begins in the Judean desert. Why he's crying in the wilderness is because it's a fulfillment He's the, he is the forerunner. He is the one that is preparing the way. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make ready, literally. And, and I think Isaiah, his prophecy is literally a reference to Israel being led back from Babylonian captivity. But the way that Matthew uses it is in a spiritual sense, and it's basically a call to prepare the way for Messiah. 
And I think that uh, that is a call not only for Messiah to enter into his public ministry as we see happening here, but could we also apply it maybe this way? It's a call for us to prepare the way for Messiah in our own lives. To prepare the entrance of Messiah into our own hearts. Have you ever, ever prepared the way for Jesus to enter into your heart? And have you prepared the way completely for him? Or have you made it a very narrow way that he can hardly squeeze through? Make the way wide. Make the way flat. Take the bumps and hindrances out of the roadway. In fact, that's the picture here that in ancient times a messenger would be sent ahead of a, of a king that would be visiting another country and he would ensure that the, uh, the, the roadway is cleared of all obstructions. That's what John is being pictured as doing spiritually. When he preaches that message, he, he is imparting that message, repent, the kingdom of God is has come near. The Messiah is here. He's come near to establish his kingdom. And so he's, he's saying, get the bumps out the road. He's preparing the people to receive Jesus the Messiah. His image here is, is a bit startling. It's, uh, he, he is in the line of Elijah. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in the book of, Ma uh, of Malachi, and I think it's uh, chapter uh, 4, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and verse 5, that uh, it, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now Jesus tells his disciples that the fulfillment of that Malachi prophecy, that before the coming of the day of the Lord, before Messiah comes to establish his kingdom, he will send Elijah the prophet first. Jesus says that John the Immerser fulfilled that prophecy because he is in the spirit and power of Elijah. You can find that uh, in chapter 11, I think, and uh, around the 14th verse. But that's, the, that's what's going on here. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. It's the forerunner of the Messiah. And look at what he eats in verse 4. Look at his features and his food. He's eating, he's first of all dressing with the common man. He's uh, dressing in very cheap clothing. Uh, not fine uh, linen, not uh, uh, silk, but he's dressed in this rough woven camel's hair. Uh, clothing or robe and just a, a crude leather belt around the waist that he would tuck it up in when he needed to move out and he's eating honey that's wild and locusts by the way I heard cicadas are invading and they're good eating like locusts uh, if you want to try some uh, maybe you can find a recipe online or something but anyway you know some bugs are good for you I guess uh, this must have been a healthy diet yet to sustain this man. But nothing fancy about him. He's a rough, rough type, as we would say today, dude, isn't he? He's, a, he's not a pushover. Um, but he is a prophet. I, I'm sure that just his appearance would call you to repentance. The severity of his appearance would really suit the message that's coming from this man's mouth and would give it even greater impact. Look at what he's doing, verses 5 and 6. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan confessing their sins. He had a pretty extensive ministry. There are large numbers of people coming out to the Judean desert down by the Jordan River that are hearing him preach. He's a curiosity, I'm sure, for one thing. No prophet for over 400 years. Here's a prophet 
Finally, God's speaking. He's drawing crowds. And He's also immersing them. You see, modern day Baptists didn't come up with the idea of immersion. The Jewish people practiced self-immersion even before John the, the immerser came on the scene. In fact, in archaeological digs, often they found prior to John's uh, existence what is called mikvah. Mikvah. And uh, a mikvah is a, it's a self-immersion uh, place. It has steps going down into, usually into the ground, and it, uh, they fill it up with water. Usually it's supposed to be running water because mikvahs have to, by Jewish law, have to uh, be filled with what is called living water, which means it's not stagnant, but it's, it's constantly being replenished. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was baptizing at the Jordan River. That was his mikvah, so to speak. And self-immersion, he's not uh, letting them immerse themselves. He's immersing them. Because this is, he, he, he is of God doing something different. This self-immersion in a mikvah was a, a symbol, a, a ritual of purification. But John puts with it this. John says, not only should you symbolically uh, be immersed, but along with that, you should be confessing your sin. He's putting repentance right up with it. And uh, you should also, in an act of faith in the good news of the kingdom, receive it. And so that's what this immersion that John was doing really was about. It was repentance, shown publicly, and a faith in the good news of the kingdom that was at hand. And so that's what's happening here. Now, if you'll jump down with me in this third chapter to verse 11, notice what John continues to say. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes, he sandals, I'm not even worthy to carry for him as a slave. He'll immerse you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand don't think of this kind of a fan. <laughs> the fan he's talking about is a winnowing fork that when the wheat was harvested, they put it on a flat place up on a high level called a threshing floor, and they take this winnowing uh, fork, and it's like uh, uh, sort of like a pitchfork, only not that much space between the, the, uh, the oh. tongs. He would, if you'd put that winnowing fork into the wheat, throw it up in the air so that the shell of the wheat, called the chaff, would blow away in the wind and the, the real wheat would drop back down on the threshing floor. And so Jesus is pictured as, uh, in verse 12, he has his winnowing fork in his hand and he's going to thoroughly purge the floor. He's going to get rid of the chaff and he's going to gather the, the real uh, grain into the, the bin, the, the garner, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable, uh, unquenchable fire. Mm -hmm. What's he talking about here? Well, let's go back to verse 11. He says, Jesus, I, I, I immerse you in water. And uh, water immersion, of course, is a symbol of new life. Uh, it's a symbol of new life. But what John the Immerser says, the Messiah Jesus, King Messiah, he's going to immerse you, notice this, he's going to immerse you with the Holy Spirit. He says in that, uh, that 11th verse, he shall immerse you with the Holy Ghost. Stop there for a minute. He's going to immerse you literally in the Holy Ghost. That is, he's not just going to symbolize new life, but he is actually going to immerse you into the life. The life himself. 
the life that the Spirit of God Himself gives. He's going to immerse you into the, uh, uh, the Spirit's life. That's what He's saying. And He says, He's going to immerse you in fire. Now, fire is said in this context to burn up unfruitful trees and the chaff. And so I think the fire part in the context here is a reference to the judgment of God upon the lost. In fact, in, uh, again, Malachi uh, chapter 3, and I believe it's uh, beginning with the first verse, God says, I'll send my messenger, and he'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he'll come, saith the Lord. Who will abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and he shall uh, sit as a refiner and, and a purifier of silver. Yes, how silver is refined by fire, okay? And so I believe what he's talking about here, and uh, there's more along those lines in the fourth chapter of Malachi, is that uh, Messiah will immerse Jews in two ways. Some of them he'll give spiritual life to. They'll be purified. Others, he will immerse them in spiritual death. They'll be consumed. I want to apply this also to us as believers because if you're a believer, Jesus has immersed you, the Holy Spirit has immersed you uh, into Jesus and also the Holy Spirit, He immerses you in fire in a sense as well. That is, He purges and He separates in our believing lives and we experience more and more the purity of his life in us. Mm -hmm. That's the preparation. <laughs> We're going to conclude here with the presentation of Messiah, uh, King Messiah. Drop down to verse 13 with me. And uh, we're going to see that Jesus desires John's immersion for himself. And I think by that, he is at least signifying the fact that he's connecting to John's ministry. And, of course, as the, as the preparation for his, and he is approving of John's ministry. So the fact that he wants John to immerse him, he's connecting and approving of John's ministry. And I want you to look at verse 15 in particular right now. And Jesus answering said, Suffer it to be so now, for, this, uh, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Remember, John uh, balked at uh, immersing Jesus. No, no, no. Uh, you should be immersing me, not me immersing you. And Jesus says, no, no. This is right. What I'm asking you to do is right. You see, what he's doing is he is associating himself in a particular way. Jesus' immersion by John identifies him with sinners. Because wasn't this immersing that John was doing, wasn't it a, an immersion uh, that was connected with repentance and the confession of sin? Yeah. And that Jesus was going to be immersed by John, he's associating himself, he's identifying himself with sinners, and he's picturing the, the, the future absolute identification with sinners that he will have on the cross when he will be totally immersed in God's wrath for sinners on that cross in the place of sinners. In fact, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 50, Jesus is anxious to get this done. And he says, I am just, I'm constrained in my heart for this baptism of fire. And he's talking about his cross work, his work on that tree. And so this is why he wants to be baptized. This is why he wants John to immerse him. It's, he's associating this with the fact that he who knew no sin 
is going to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. That He is going to carry up all our sins in His body on that tree. Amen. And so Jesus the Immersion by John the Immerser is associating with sinners like you and I. Not only that, look at verse 16. John did it. John immersed Jesus. And it says, And Jesus, when He was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Doesn't that really clearly indicate that the immersion was in the water? Under the water? He came up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto Him. And He saw the Spirit of God descending upon Him like a dove. Here is, I think, anointing. Not only associating, but in his baptism, here is his anointing. In fact, in the book of Isaiah again, and chapter 42, and the first verse, listen to what the prophet says. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. This is a prophecy of Messiah's ministry. And here we have that actually happening. The life-giving Spirit of God anoints him in the form of a dove. And we know that a dove is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit in the Scripture. In fact, people in the scripture were anointed kings were anointed when they were coronated as king Israel's kings were anointed remember Samuel he anointed Saul he anointed David kings were anointed that's what's happening here it's the spiritual anointing of the Messiah kings were anointed when they took the throne of Israel but also it is the commissioning, the fulfillment of Isaiah 42.1. It's the commissioning of the Lord's servant for His ministry in Holy Spirit power and presence. In fact, when Jesus got back to His own synagogue in Nazareth where He grew up, He stood up to read the scroll of Isaiah and He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and hath anointed me. Well, here is that anointing. Public, uh, publicly pictured. Notice he comes up out of the water. He, it's a picture of being raised to life and bringing about a new creation out of former chaos. You remember at the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, it says that the earth was without form and void. It was tohu vabohu. It was chaos. And the Spirit of God hovered, brooded over the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God brings creation. And what we see here is exactly a replica of that. It is at His anointing, He's being raised to life, but He is also pictured as being, uh, bringing about a new creation out of chaos. In fact, if any man be in Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's a third part in his presentation here that uh, pertains to his immersion. Not only is he associating, not only is he in, uh, undergoing his anointing, but in verse 17 there is the approving of heaven and the voice a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased isn't that kind of a quote from Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 3 that we just read a moment ago my uh, my servant in whom I delight out of the heavens literally this voice was heard this is my Son, the Beloved One, in whom I am well pleased, or in whom I am delighted. In other words, the idea, He is the Eternal Son. I've always been pleased with Him. 
I am pleased with him now, and I will be pleased forever with him. He's the eternal son that brought me to light before the creation of this earth, and now he does, and at his immersion he does. You remember when God created the heavens and the earth? At the end of those six days of creation, God looked upon what he had made, and he said, Behold, it is good. It brought God the light. Here is the new creation that is going to come out of this Jesus that will be raised as he was out of the water, will be raised out of death and will bring about a new creation and a new humanity. At the end of the flood, when Noah and the ark rested on the face of the earth, he sent out a dove several times until that dove didn't return anymore and emerged from that ark really the beginning of a new humanity. And that's all pictured here in this. It's the official presentation of King Messiah. Messiah, the, the, the king who is the creator of a new world that will be occupied by a new humanity. And if you're a believer, that's you. Amazing. I want you to go back in closing to verse 11. Because I want you to catch again how this applies to us. John the Immerser says, Jesus is going to baptize you, notice this, into Christ. Into uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit is going to baptize you into Christ. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. Now, I want to cross-reference that. I want to cross-reference that with 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Let me just uh, quickly jump back to that verse because I, I want you to, to hear it in this context. You ready? For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. He says, uh, uh, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So, Human beings can water immerse, but only God can spirit immerse. There is, the scripture says, only one immersion spiritual. Only one spiritual immersion in the Christian's life. Ephesians 4 tells us that. There's only one baptism, only one spiritual immersion. However, listen to me very closely, because this is crucial. That one spiritual immersion that every believer undergoes has two different directions. And I want you to see it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. First of all, the believer is baptized into Jesus. And when you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus, you're given a new position. You have a new position. It's called in Christ. And when you have that new position in Christ, guess what? You get a new identity. You're not who you used to be anymore. You're a new person in the Messiah. You're a new creation. And along with that new identity, because you're in a new position, you have new authority. Because the position that you're put in is you're seated with Jesus in the heavenlies. And so he's above all the evil forces in this universe, and you're seated in Him there. Your spirit is seated with Christ in the heavens. Amen. So you have a new position that gives you a total new identity, righteous in the eyes of God, and a new authority. You have authority over the, all the powers of hell, so to speak. But the sect don't miss this. This is the second direction that most people miss about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first direction is the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus, gives you a new position. But the latter part of that 13th verse says that Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. And that gives you new power. That is not you in Christ, that's Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. That gives you a new ability. What are some of the, what's the power, what's the new power, what's the new ability that you get when Christ baptizes you with the Holy Spirit? 
The new power you get is, I think, threefold. Number one, you get a special unction. You get a special anointing of the Holy Spirit so you can understand Scripture. Don't look it up, but write down 1 John 2, verse 20 and verse 27. Amen. Not only that, but you also... You also, through this, have the ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command, Ephesians 5.18. Be ye, present tense, filled, always filled with the Holy Spirit. Walk not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Paul tells us in Galatians. So that's a new power as well. You get uh, uh, not only a new understanding of Scripture, you get filled with, the ho with holiness, and uh, not only that, you get an overflowing of ministry. You get uh, an overflow for ministering to people. Jesus promised, he said, when the key of the Holy Spirit has come, when I'm glorified and I send the Holy Spirit, He's going to baptize you in such a way that out of your belly, out of your innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. Unlimited source of blessed ministry to others. Let me illustrate it as best as I can. I have a bowl of water here. Now, remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is twofold, in two directions. One baptism, but two directions. The first direction is the Holy Spirit baptizes you as a believer when you get saved into Christ. Let's say that this bowl of water represents Christ. Let's say that the sponge represents you. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God immerses you plunges you, submerges you, immerses you into Christ, into Jesus, all right? That's the first direction of Holy Spirit baptism. But the second part is that then Christ, He immerses you with the Holy Spirit. And that's where we get new power. And so, you're immersed with the Holy Spirit by Christ, and guess what? It's like a sponge, you're filled, right? You're filled with Him. So, one baptism, but two directions. You're plunged into, and then that fills you. That makes sense? So let, then let me ask you this question. Have you ever been immersed by the Holy Spirit into Jesus? And the answer to that is, yes, if you have received Jesus as your personal Savior. Because it's not a feeling. It happens. It's a spiritual baptism that happens the moment you receive Jesus. You have then been, by the Holy Spirit, immersed into Jesus. When you receive Him. You're in Christ. Second question is this. Have you allowed Christ to immerse you in the Holy Spirit? Now, both of them require a choice. You have to choose to receive Jesus as your Savior. But as many as received Him, He gives the power to become the sons of God, even if they believe on His name. You have to make a choice to be saved, and when you make that choice to be saved, the Holy Spirit automatically immerses you in Jesus. You also, daily, and moment by moment, once you're saved, have to make a choice to allow Jesus to immerse you with the Holy Spirit to anoint you, to fill you. It's a choice. It's yours for the taking, but you it doesn't happen automatically. Now, it happened automatically in my illustration that if I am plunged into Jesus, I'm filled with the Spirit. That's where the illustration breaks down. You have to choose to soak up that filling of the Spirit. It's a personal choice that you must make. 
And I don't know how well you're making that choice and how regularly you're making that choice. But I'm telling you, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you are sinning against God. Mm-hmm. You're saved, but you're sin- that's God's will for your life. Mm-hmm. That you might have an anointed, a, a, a new power, an anointed understanding of the Scripture. That you might have this filling of the Spirit for holy living. Amen. And victory over sin. It's for every Christian. Yeah. It's not, there's no super saints. It's for every Christian that you might then have this overflowing of ministry through the Holy Spirit that fills you. Let's pray. Mm-hmm. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just make this clearer than I've been able to. You communicate it to each heart. Lord, you make this make sense. And you bring about the conviction that you want to bring about. There might be folks here that really, maybe they've played and pretended that they're saved, but truly they've they've not been saved. And others may truly be saved, but they're living a self-centered life. And they have not uh, allowed you to immerse them with the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just make it very clear to every listener where they are at spiritually and that they would be convicted of it and that they would want you to have your way in their life. Because if you don't, then even if we're Christians, we're only living a cultural Christian life. It's not real. It's just going through the motions. Make it real. Make it to be genuine. The genuine life that you yourself are and that you yourself live through us if we allow you to immerse us with the Spirit. May there be an immersion that's going on in a spiritual sense in every person's life that is in the sound of my voice. I pray it for your glory. Amen.